Well, thank you very much. I'm here as a friend and I'm here as an admirer uh, of what Code for America has done and, and continues to do. I'm from this place. Who's been to London? Great. This is what London looks like. Um, <laughs> it's, it was recently made in colour. Uh, we have, uh, yeah, we've got big red buses and this is a, a London postcard from the 1950s. Very, very little has changed, as you would imagine. Uh, this is, you know, this is our uniform for going to work. It's what we have to wear. <laughs> and this is our government. And our government is so old, we have to show it in black and white because we've been going for some time. Now, we've had a bit of a relationship, you and I, in our countries about government, so I'm not going to go down that fact, but, uh, but we'll just leave it there. Okay. So some of you might think, well, why is this guy talking to us today? We're working on city level in the States. And the reason is, and I was, like many busy people, I, I should blog more. I don't blog that often, but I wrote this blog post a while back, and people said, oh, that really resonated here. And I wrote this thing about delivery because I've got this lardy door job, and I'm part of the cabinet office, which I'll talk about in a moment. But um, one of the things that struck me time and again when I came to government is the, the fact that getting stuff done is really hard. And I was just delighted to see some of the stuff that you're all doing across the cities and that the pres presenters have been showing us here. So I wrote this blog post, and it seemed to have resonated. So I'm going to use this as the basis of, of, of my talk today to talk about the strategy as delivery and really how you do that. Because if you've had a chance to look at that blog post, at the bottom, you'll see this. And our world has suddenly and dramatically changed. And that's really something that we, when we're working day to day, we can forget. But we are right at the heart, uh, in the middle, of a, of a huge change in government. Not government digital services or government web services, but government. And at the heart of any government, or any political system, there is policy. And for too long, the digital debate all around the world, whether you go to Estonia or Australia or Mexico, where I was recently, for too long, the digital debate is about policy. It's about what are we going to do about government policy? What are we going to do about digital services? What's our policy option? What we are living through is not a policy option. It is a delivery crisis. Because people use government services. They use them every day. And we forget in government about the end users of our services. Not us in here, but all of us in government. There are 440,000 of my colleagues in the United Kingdom who work in central government. It is very easy in an organization that size to forget about your users, even if you are one yourself. And we're in the middle of a delivery crisis for many of the reasons that's already been stated here in the last couple of days, not least procurement and so on. So today I'm going to talk about how we make the strategy of delivery work, how we bring that to life, and some of the battles and some of the issues that we've had to deal with over the last two and a half to three years. Um, it's no cookie cutter approach, it's different for every country, but I think some of this will resonate. And I'm quite happy, by the way, we'd love to get into detail with anyone at the end of the session if I can help in any way. So let's talk about that. It's worthwhile talking about how I came to be on this stage here and how I had this fancy pants job title. Well, 10 years ago, I was roughly where you are today, and I'm talking to those of you in Code for America who are working right now um, in cities. This motley crew includes some of the finest digital minds our country has to offer, and some of them are actually, one of them is actually working uh, uh, in government right now. Tom Steinberg's on the front, runs My Society. I was fortunate enough to be the sort of shady bag man behind My Society and get it funded and, and ha help Tom set it up. And we wrote the business plan on my kitchen table. Sorry, he wrote the business plan on my kitchen table. I made the tea. Um, <laughs> we like a cup of tea. And My Society was born uh, as a result of that. And I'm very proud of My Society. And uh, I'm only going to touch on two parts of my background today. The first is my society. And um, can I just say, who knows my society here? Yeah, yeah, you all got that. So my society, civic startup, a bit like Sunlight uh, over here some time ago. And my society did some great things. But I listened to Claire yesterday, and he reminded me of one of the first problems we had in my society, and one of the big lessons that I've taken with me to get to this job. One of the first products my society issued was called Fix My Street. And it was about potholes. And yesterday we heard Clay talk about, you know, it's great doing this great stuff. You know, nobody's against doing better services for potholes. Well, I'm afraid there is a lobby against that. And I know the name of it. It's called local government. Because <laughs> we created my society to create these, these services. One of the first was, was um, 
fix my street. And I remember, I'll never forget the sort of depressing year I had walking around government saying, here, there's this thing, it's created, it's created massive amounts of civic utility, it's yours for free, off you go. And people went, thanks for that, put it over there, not interested in the slightest. And what I realized, it was a very hard lesson to learn 10 years ago, was that we hadn't quite got the user need. For five years, I was just angry with government for not taking it. But what I realized is the product wasn't quite good enough. We should have focused more and more on user need. We had to show users using it, and we had to show some measurable performance and data before people were forced to adopt it. Because government needs always, always outweighs user need, every single time. And the way around that is making sure the product is so beautiful and so useful that it cannot be ignored. And it took me a long time to learn that lesson. Today, that's why we make design and service design the organizing principle of digital services in our country. Some years after that, I was fortunate enough to have a similar job at The Guardian. I ran digital development there between 2008 and 11. And again, same principle, another lesson, another lesson I brought to this job. So The Guardian, many of you will know, has done a great job in terms of digital transformation. And I think that a small team of us with Emily Bell, Tim Brooks, and others who put that together in 2008, really drove that on. We drove it on by releasing sort of news apps with charge, which at the time everyone said, you can't charge for a news app. We did, it worked really well. And we released a steady stream of stuff to create that digital momentum. The interesting thing about The Guardian, I remember help writing the digital strategy, or one of the first digital strategies in 2010, was that followed 18 months of relentless delivery of digital services. And the lesson I learned on reflection of The Guardian was you've got to deliver first, then strategize later. Because government particularly is full of empty strategies. They sit on, on shelves, usually dusty word documents. No one reads them. It's actually delivery that drives uptake, that drives the strategic drive to get stuff done. So deliver first and strategize later. And those are two lessons that I brought to the government digital service. So I just want to talk to you a little bit now about the GDS, what it is, and why it works. Sorry for those of you who know this, but this sort of exposition is, is necessary to really understand what follows. Before I go on, I should add that I know that we're talking very much about the UK. So to make this presentation really usable for you, I've put in a couple of um, popular references to films over here. And at the end, before the last slide, I'm going to tell you why I chose the two films here. I was delighted, by the way, to see the guy yesterday put a, an image of Kevin Costner in his presentation. So I just can't think of a better way to get uh, Kevin Costner into a tech slide, but I tried today. You'll see in a minute. Okay, so I'm part of the Cabinet Office, and that sits at the centre of government in the UK. And we sit in the same building as the Treasury, and it's really the bit of government that, that runs other parts of the government. So we're very much at the centre. It's a small department with very far-reaching far powers. And that's vitally important to understand that. We're not one of a... Our government is hugely federated, a bit like yours, but we're sitting very much at the centre. And let me give you an idea of scale. So the UK has 60 plus million citizens and users, all these businesses and so on. So we're working at scale. Okay, it's the first thing to understand. So to deliver on the task and to deliver to that scale, we focused on five big tasks. And I just want to run you through what they are now. The first I know the answer to because we've done a show of hands. The first is GovUK. I strongly would imagine that many of you will think it's actually we just do GovUK. Actually, we do five things. So I want to tell you about the other four right now. So the first is GovUK. Now I'm going to pause for a moment and say happy birthday. Because tomorrow morning, about 4 a.m. UK time, GovUK is one year old. I was going to have to sing you happy birthday to you, but that would be pushing it a bit too much. But there's a bunch of people that are having a party and having some cake. Cake is a theme I'm going to come back to on a regular basis. Um, and that's GovUK. It's been tremendously successful. It's simpler, clearer, and faster for users. And it's been designed. It's been designed for users. And we've put service design at the heart of the thinking. I'm fortunate enough to get to do this for a job, but there are people like Ben Terrett, Russell Davis, Tom Loosemore, and others who have worked tremendously hard to make that thing so beautiful and so useful. The second thing we do is identity. You may not know this. Identity is a problem that's it's bothered governments for a long time. In the UK, we're no different from here. We have identity stacks in all parts of our technology infrastructure. We have massive services of identity for tax, for health, for benefits. None of them are particularly elegant because actually it's a problem that nobody has cracked. 
So what we've done with identity and what we're doing is federating that system. We're effectively piggybacking government on people who are good at this stuff already, banks, mobile operators, and so on. Because identity is a thorny problem that we all need to solve. We're running this service out right now. The simple proposition is when you identify yourself to government to, to, to transact, you will be presented, it's your choice, who validates your identity. A bank, uh, a post office in our case, um, a mobile operator, and we have about eight or nine companies already providing identity to us. So we've switched identity from something, something that government does to, to something that users select how they deal with government. And in doing so, we've changed, I think, 20 years of thinking about identity in the digital space in government. It's, we're at the very early days yet. The first services run out with our tax system this month, but we expect we'll provide proof of identity for 45 million users. Technology. Who works in digital here? Who works in technology here? Mm, it's interesting. Words are important, aren't they? So we have a technology state in the UK, technology estate in government, which is bewildering in terms of its complexity. For the first, first issue we have is that we have 24 departments, 300 agencies, each of them with an IT department. But for too long in government, technology has been beholden to itself. We buy lots and lots of technology. In fact, you could argue we can't buy anymore. And yet our services, our digital services, are seen as the outcome of technology purchasing. The organizing principle of government and technology is procurement. And yet the organizing principle of digital services has to be the user and the service design. So when we put digital in technology, we are literally starting in the wrong place and guaranteeing failure. So one of the biggest things we've done is move technology to digital. So I run the government digital services, and the CTO of the UK government works for digital, works for me. Now, that's a huge change, because suddenly technology becomes not something that determines a digital service of the future. It becomes the thing that you go to when you need some technology. Technology is a fourth order question in government. The first question needs to be the user need. The second question needs to be the policy need. The third question is the operational need. And then you should ask the question, now then, what technology may we need to provide the service? Instead, we say all the time, what's our technology need? What's our system, system need? It's a systemic problem that we see technology as primary and digital output as secondary. And that's just crazy. So if you ever get chance to do this, if you ever get chance to, to run the show at a national level, one of the first battles you've got to fight is putting technology in its place. It's a rather a large industry, I recognize that. But in terms of government, technology must be subservient to the digital services that we, we, we um, create. To give you an idea of size of that, in central government alone, in the UK government, we spend 6.7 billion pounds, about $10 billion a year on technology across 412,000 staff. And our first year savings alone are taking 500 million out of that budget. And we, we can and will continue to do a lot more. Some of the slides earlier I saw about the varying prices in buying a printer uh, made me laugh, actually, because if, if that's the variation, then you're not doing so badly. You should see some of the stuff we have to deal with with so many departments. So we all have this problem that technology spend and technology structures are getting in the way. The fourth thing we do is measurement. If you go to gov.uk forward slash performance right now, what you will see is real live service data. Now, if there was someone in this audience who had got a browser up that could go to that site and tell me right now how many people right now are renewing a car tax license in the UK, who could do that? Oh, it's Alex. Hello, Alex. Not at all a plant, by the way. Four hundred and thirty nine users right now in the UK are buying a driving license from government with a ninety five percent satisfaction level. We need to know that. We should know that all the time. That's a digital that's a measurement and a performance metric about a digital service. We should all know that. That information is not government's information, it's all our information. So the critical thing to do we've done is create a platform where all our service information is published in real time. That's a very difficult thing for government to do because the biggest problem that we've faced, and I think all governments faced, is the unknown amounts of failure waste in the system. 
How many people start a transaction and don't complete it? How many people have to call a call center five times to get the, the service that they finally need? By putting a measurement platform out there, it's driven standards up and continues to do so. And you can see some of that here. And the final thing is transformation. And probably this is the, most, the biggest thing that we've got going on right now. If you go to gov.uk forward slash transformation, for those of you who've got a browser in front of you, you can see more details about this. You can see that 25 of the most important transactions in government, we're running a program to transform all of those. We create alphas, then betas, and then we finally turn the existing stuff off. Now, if you get a chance to have a go at this at central level, it is vitally important, I think, to recognize two things. And I made this mistake when we started about trying to go for stuff that's neat and cool and attractive. Actually, don't do that. Go for stuff that makes a big, big difference. So, one of the big conceits of government, certainly our government, I suspect yours, is that government's big, right? Government's big, it's huge. I mean, you just had a, well, you might as well just turn yours off for a bit and nothing fell over, but there we are. <laughs> but government thinks of itself as big in an analog world, because in an analog world, it is big. But in a digital world, government isn't big at all. Government services most certainly aren't big. Once we started analyzing government services in the UK, we realized how small they were. This, this little chart here, for those of you, I'm not sure if you can read it, let me read that to you. We have 660 services, transactional services in government, in central government. You can guess the big stuff, right? A driving license, a passport, that sort of stuff. Um, of those, by volume, 90% are hit by the top 25. 97% hit by the top 50. So if you go for the top 50, you get virtually all the government services. What we have is a very long chain of stuff which is small but vitally important. And it's vitally important because it's stuff that only government can do. I'm going to show you some of that right now. But it's critical if you get the chance to have a go at this is you go at the big stuff straight away because the big stuff takes longer to do, but it's more meaningful. These are some of the things that we're doing. Number one, electoral registration. It's quite important in a democracy, getting that one right letting people to register to vote online. 47 million users hit by that. In the UK, student finance has become, um, it's become one of the, the, the sort of bugbears of, of any digital service, and we've made that um, a, a much better experience for 1.3 million students. Digital self-assessment, paying tax. We run on tax, it's important we get that right to make sure you've got a single place for every user and every business to see all the tax affairs digitally and make that user system work and work really well. So we're going after the big stuff which in all due humility makes us the show. You see, you've got to get Kevin Costner in there somewhere. <laughs> so the model, the model what we've found is actually going after the big stuff and pairing government right down to the big stuff that makes a difference to millions of people is where the value is. So how did we get here? How did we get to this point in the UK? And I think that these five, next five things I show you, and we've heard some of them already in, in the last few days, uh, will resonate. Uh, with uh, many of you. I couldn't help in the last 10 days but look at healthcare.gov. I could virtually assure you that was going to fail because of the budget size. Any web service, any digital service that costs over $100 million, that is going to fail. There's just too much money at stake. There's too many partners. You know, all the recipes for, for failure are there. Large-scale outsourcing, large, many systems that don't work false deadlines that drive poor decision making, it's all there. We see this all the time. These issues are systemic. By understanding these issues and by rooting around them is how we've had the success that we have. So we think of these issues as the square of despair. And the square of despair is really the, the focus of, of the five points I want to make today. So let's just explain the square of despair. You will have recognized it's a rectangle. I get that. Okay. <laughs> The first one of the four forces acting on government, on digital government, is money. I know about you, we have less of it, we have increasingly less of it. We've bought all the tech in the world, and yet our services haven't caught up with that. So, recognizing that we have to do stuff more quickly and more cheaply. The second is unhappy users, end users, but also inside the system. We've now got 400,000 people who are generally pretty unhappy with the technology and the digital services that they themselves are using at work. The third one is security. I don't mean the Snowden type of security. I mean this pernicious view that security must come ahead of usability at all times. 
When I started in government, I was presented with a laptop, which required, I kid you not, 22 discrete pieces of information so I could work it. And as you've seen today, at that point, I had a one-month-old daughter. I couldn't remember what I had for breakfast, let alone 22 pieces of information. And when I did that, I couldn't send an email to all the staff. And why not? Because of security. We've just got to get usability ahead of security. And the final one, procurement in the room. <laughs> Didn't expect to clap for that, but I know where to go back now next time. So here's the message. You won't win by tackling this head on when you go to central government. We talked to Jen about this. I talked to everybody who had a similar la -di -da job like mine in central government. We had the EN boys and CIOs and this, that, and the other. And some of them were my friends. I went and talked to them. I said, look, you went to government. It's the best one in the world. You didn't get done what you wanted to get done. Why was that? And they said, well, I tried to sort out procurement directly, but I lost because I didn't have enough lawyers. Or I sort of tried out security, but it's an unbalanced game because I can't see what they're playing with. I tried to sort out everyone's staff's IT, but we've got 26 different IT departments. Or I tried to sort out the money problem, but actually I run into ministerial issues. I run into the, the, the big IT suppliers. You can't win. You can't tackle these problems head on. You've got to root around them. So here's the five ways that we've had success and we continue to have success in rooting around the problems. The first is a phrase that I'm sure everyone here has heard before, work on stuff that matters. I don't want to be flippant about that, but there's what matters and what really matters. When I started in the summer in the UK, we had riots on the street in the United Kingdom. This is not good. This is a profound challenge to democracy. So when we make a decision on what we're going to work on, we make sure we make, we make services that matter a great deal to a lot of people, but also there are things that only government can do. One of the big questions we should ask ourselves when we all work in government or whatever level is, could someone else do this? Because we are a finite resource. Everyone in here, you are a very, very finite resource. So we must ask, could someone else do this? And if they can, give it to them. Because focusing only on the stuff that government can do and should do is where the win comes. This is a lasting power of attorney. In the UK and anywhere, if you're going through this process, you're probably going through this process at a time of life where you're having other things to deal with, elderly relatives, someone's died in test date, something like that. We made a digital service, this is it. And I'm gonna show you that world-class technology that we made and how it works. If you forgive the video for 30 seconds, it's worth watching. This tool takes you through step by step. There's 10 or 11 sections you have to fill in. And in each case, you're given a, a very small bit of introduction and then the choices you have to make. The point with this is that when people are filling in the forms, they could be filling in maybe the same name and address six times over. Uh, but by entering these details, as we've done here, that gives them one set of details that we can then populate every single form with. It's not rocket science. It's a simple web service. I can't tell you how hard that was because we had to take on HR, recruitment, skills, procurement to make a simple web service. But when we did, we found out something amazing happened. We got a call from the people that run the call center at the Office of Public Guardian. They said, oh, we've got a problem. You're going to have to add something for us now. We're like, what, what, what have we done? We've created the service. Said, well, people are phoning up to say how much they like it. And uh, <laughs> we've never had that before. So could you add a positive feedback button to our interface? Which we did. It's amazing what happens when you do that. <laughs> Colleagues come back with you and they want to work with you more and more. It's working on stuff that matters. Dealing with the enterprise, number two. We've talked a lot about that today, but what does that really mean with? If you deal with the enterprise on the terms of the enterprise, again, you will lose. I cannot tell you how many lever arch files I've seen full of requirements documents. They take a long time to write. Heaven knows who writes them or reads them, and God knows how we manage to procure with them. But if you play on those terms, you lose. This is a little chart from Booz, which I'll show here. And again, apologies if you can't quite read that. The first time shows the amount of money we spend as a government on IT. So in the UK, we're pretty much near the end of the chart. The two countries, by the way, that spend most are Switzerland and Sweden. Don't know about Sweden, I think it's a counting thing. But on Switzerland, pretty sure because it includes the cost of a particle accelerator, which, you know, <laughs> is quite a quite an expensive bit of IT. So you could say they're an outlier. Now what Booz did is they mapped that spend on the outcome of the digital services. And in the UK, you can see that despite spending nearly as much as any other country, we're getting such a low return on that spend. So you can't spend any more money on IT when you get these jobs. People in government say, what's your budget? I've got a billion pound budget. You know, we've done the whole thing with less than 70 million pounds. 
That's the whole thing. The operating costs, the infrastructure costs for GovUK are 2.1 million pounds. In the UK, that doesn't even get us into the frame for, for having to have to tender that amount of money. You can do this so cheaply that competing on the terms of the enterprise means that you lose. That's the amount of money that the group I've worked in, the Efficiency and Reform Group, have taken out of the government spending system in the last year. That's about 4% of the GDP in the UK. And one of the ways we've done this, we have to do many different things, is by getting people in. This is the, um, this is the, this is the Silicon Roundabout, that map, which he never said that now. This is a part of East London where there's a cluster of tech firms. And one of the interesting things about the UK is we've managed to spend over 80% of our IT spending on, I think, seven or eight companies. Our parliament call that an oligopoly. And yet, less than a mile from our offices in central government, we have one of the most vibrant and dynamic clusters of technology and digital companies in the world. And yet, we've managed to make them feel that they're excluded from the creation of digital services. That is insane. I think Eric Gunderson summed it up quite nicely last week about healthcare.gov. If lessons like this aren't, aren't learned, if we don't see the need for procurement reform after this, we are genuinely in trouble. So one of the best things we've done, I think, is a digital service framework. We've now got dozens, or hopefully hundreds, of these companies on a framework, and we can draw down and get them into the government system. Three, start recruiting now. This is our office, what it looks like. We're inside government. One cannot be too revolutionary inside government when you get the chance, but you need some insignia. Skull and crossbones is a bit dramatic, but there's nothing wrong with a bit of bunting or a bit of cake. So get these people in. Hire the very finest minds in digital and then dress them in onesies. That would be my ex. <laughs> As I launch Gov UK, Etienne Pollard on the right, Jamie on the left, they won't thank me for this. But have some fun while you're doing it. Insist on Hawaiian shirts. Absolutely, de rigueur. Make sure your insignia is good. Our organizing principle is design. These design assets resonate right across the government system. And have lots of cake. That was our 100 day cake. And make sure the stickers, by the way, I left some stickers from the reception outside because you can't beat a few stickers for your laptop. These all seem like trivial things, but actually going against the type, going against the grain, making sure that it's a bit of fun, bringing this generation in is utterly crucial. We started that literally on day one when we started. This is a very modest slide, but it shows me with my head in my hands about a month ago, looking at finally getting my hands on the architecture diagram for our motoring division. Yes, that is what that thing is. I actually know how that works now. It's astonishing. But the hard reforms have got to be started straight away because some of the stuff that we know that you have as well is that our infrastructure actually doesn't belong to us anymore. 15 years ago, 18 years ago, we did something quite, I think, foolish in the UK. We tried to outsource risk. We try to outsource risk by giving massive SI contracts out, saying, hey, actually, you deliver these services back to us. And guess what? The idea that government outsourcing risk is crazy, because who picks up the bill at the end of the day? Who's responsible for healthcare.gov? It's your government. You can't, you can't outsource this stuff. So we're now in a position of actually having to reform our services without quite knowing how many of them work. So starting those reforms straight away are important. This is a picture of a big, big red truck. I am fully aware of that. And it's full of mail. And this big red truck, and ones like it, take, take paper to our motoring division twice a day. The entire building is built to receive paper. One of the problems with that is that recently, a few years ago, one of our biggest leasing companies in the UK, fleet leasing companies, moved offices. And the V5, the piece of paper that, that every car, every vehicle has in the UK, had to be updated with the address of that headquarter. And yes, we did spend money on sending 500,000 documents to the place where they were rekeyed and a new piece of paper was issued. You could move one field in a database table. Who knew? But we paid that amount of money. These reforms are urgent, and they need starting on right away, which is what we've been doing. And the final thing is delivery. You have to deliver at all times. The critical thing in government, and particularly in central government, the one thing that you have in your armament that nobody else has in government is the ability to deliver, and deliver often, because that is kryptonite to most people in government. It's the one thing that you just cannot get done. So there are the five things that we've done in the UK, and we think that it's a model. We think there's some lessons there for everybody. And particularly if you get the chance, if you're working at city level, you will take some of, this, some of these issues right now. You will know these issues at a relatively small level. They're the same issues, they just get bigger. 
So get used to dealing with them now, get really good at them now, and get used to some friction, because dealing with them takes on some very, very big interest straight away. If I'd say one thing about Code for America is that you're all lovely. That's great. It's great being lovely. Wait till you're the bad guy, because you really have got quite a lot of that to come when you step up to the enterprise level and central government. And the good thing is, it's not complicated. It's just really, really hard, as Michael Slaby said. So the final point for me is it always helps to have political backing. I don't mean public service backing, I mean the top level of politics. I'm going to sh show you a video right now. This is Francis Moore, the Minister for Cabinet Office, speaking in Parliament. And these words, I never thought I'd hear a political uh, appointee say in my lifetime. Of the government digital service, which is committed to ensuring that as we uh, reform the delivery of public services, they are designed around the needs of the user rather than has been far too often the case in the past, being designed to suit the convenience of the government. Gary Streeter. I'm glad you applauded that because that does, that, that does require applause and to have that level of political leadership from a, a politician to have been relentless on this agenda has given us the cover that we've needed. So why are we doing all this? I said at the start, democracy faces profound pressures. I had the fortune to go around the world talking to some of the governments, and we're all facing similar pressures. And we shouldn't forget that. It's a big thing at play here. And that's really because we face an existential threat in government. All of us are civil servants and public servants of one sort or another. And the threat we face is that the government can become irrelevant. Because if we don't deliver what users need, they'll just root around us in a digital world. And we need to reconnect. We need to make government look like this. This is the Reichstag building in Germany. It's transparency. It's government as it should be. You can see right through it. And you can see what policymakers are doing. And we have an opportunity to do that and remake digital government. Because digital services are not an end of themselves. They're an opportunity to do just that and to remake government. It's not about changing government websites. It's about changing government. And that's why we're here. And that's why I support you fully and I want to challenge you. If you ever get the chance to step up, and if you ever get to do this at enterprise level, or even if you're doing it at city level, don't walk away from those big challenges and think about the square of despair. Don't tackle them head on and root around them. And if you do that, it will be difficult. You'll have some wins and you'll have some losses. But from over the water, you'll get a special gift for us. We'll send you some cake.